Okay, we'll just give it a minute for some people to join us. I'm just confirming that the link works. <laughs> uh, looks like it, yeah. Okay, so as people are coming in, okay, it seems to be working. So, Sego, uh, Sego, Guego. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to our second annual Student Science, um, our third speaker of this round in our Indigenous Scientist Chats. Um, so my name is Jenna Barnhart, and um, I'm the Indigenous Research Assistant for Student Science. Um, and if this is your first time hearing about us, we're a subsidiary initiative launched out of Ryerson University's Sci Exchange program in 2019. Our objective has been to promote science outreach, science knowledge mobilization, and uh, traditional knowledge translation combined with Indigenous teachings um, to Indigenous students. So throughout the years, myself and the Indigenous Knowledge and Outreach Coordinator, Amber Sandy, have been working hard to offer science research programming specifically to Indigenous youth and teachers. So if you're interested in hearing more about our past and future programming, you can find us all on the social media platforms under at SciExchangeRU, which is shown here on the screen, or on our website, um, ryerson.ca slash SciExchange slash Indigenous Outreach, which is also shown here. So for today's program, we have been graciously able to partner with our friends at Let's Talk Science to host this webinar and um, welcome our speaker, Dr. Marsha Anderson, to talk to us today about her career in medicine, a little bit about her journey as an Indigenous um, medical professional. Um, she's a member of the Korean Anishinaabe Nation and she practices in internal medicine and public health in Manitoba as well as she's involved in various um, Indigenous academic initiatives at the University of Manitoba, but uh, I will let her tell you about herself. So um, welcome, Dr. Anderson. Take it away. Thank you, Jenna, and uh, thank you for having me here today. So, hamataki pe pete tu tu mano maki ai chante washte na pe chiuza pe ai. I am joining you today from my home, which is just outside of Winnipeg in Treaty One territory, um, which is the you know territory of my my ancestors and uh, I have two kids, they're not home right now. Uh, they do horseback riding lessons on Saturday mornings. So my dad took them and is giving them lunch. Um, I also have two dogs, which you might hear at some point because sometimes they bark a lot. So um, I'll just start off by talking a bit around uh, how I got into medicine and what life was like, and then talking a bit about some of the work that I'm doing right now and how I got prepared for it. Um, I would say, just to start with, that the, the way my career looks as a doctor is definitely different than what I imagined it would be like before I became a doctor, um, mainly because I didn't really know what all of the different options were. So I grew up mostly in the north end of Winnipeg, but lived a couple different places before I was six as well. And one of um, the things my parents told me was that 
since the time I was about four years old, I was saying I was going to be a doctor. And uh, it was always kind of hard for me to understand when people didn't know what they wanted to be when they grew up, just because I always had that knowing that this was what I was going to do. But it's really not unusual for people not to know it at all. Um, I think I was really lucky to, to know it and to have that as both kind of an anchor and as a guidepost, like I always knew what I was aiming for. Um, when I was a kid, I was also really lucky uh, to kind of be shown and, and told uh, how smart I was. Uh, and lots of us don't really get that. Uh, but I learned to read before kindergarten. My mom taught me when I was also around four years old. Uh, and I just read a ton. My mom read with me. Then I went into school. Uh, an interesting fact, again, was when the, the very first time I got sent to the principal's office was actually in kindergarten. Um, and I had just gone transferred schools in kindergarten. And... Um, because I knew how to read, I just assumed all kids my age knew how to read. Like we don't really, especially at that age, although even now sometimes it's hard for us to understand how people are different and how different brains work differently and people learn at different speeds. So when I found out this kid in my new kindergarten class couldn't read, I was really surprised. Uh, and I said something about it and I don't think I said anything mean. I think it was just like, what do you mean you can't read? But he started crying and I got sent to the principal's office. Um, so that wasn't the best way to learn th that uh, my brain was a bit different from other people's. Um, and then we moved schools again two more times before I was at the school where I spent the rest of my elementary school in we moved, started there in grade, partway through grade one. And in grade two, I was so bored all the time uh, that they had me take a bunch of, of tests, like IQ tests and different, um, like reading and spelling and, and math tests. Uh, and I, I did like high above what my current grade level was. And so I skipped a grade. And I mentioned these things because it made a big difference for me as a kid to know that I was smart and to have that confidence and to have people around me also know that I was smart and support me in that. Because uh, lots of kids, um, and I would say lots of Indigenous kids, when we don't have people in our families who went to university ahead of us, uh, we also might not have people telling us that that's possible for us. And so I was really fortunate from a, that young age uh, to be told that I could have this, this big career. So it was also helpful for me to know that that was what I wanted to do and that I had the ability to do it because uh, I did go to school in the north end of Winnipeg um, and through junior high and high school uh, had a lot of friends and, and peers who were doing things that teenagers do um, in terms of going out partying and stuff like that. And I, I did feel left out at times. I wasn't allowed to do that. Uh, my family, uh, I was raised in a very Christian home, so we weren't allowed. But at the same time, I really wanted to make good and consistent choices that were gonna help me get to my goal of being a doctor as fast as possible. And so even though I felt left out at times, um, and I definitely wished that I could have done some of that stuff, uh, I also had, um, yeah, I had the comfort of knowing that, I, that not doing it meant that there wasn't going to be any kind of potential unintended consequences that might get in my way of going to university or going on. I... One of the things I did right throughout, well, from the time I was a young kid and through high school, I had a lot of interests. And so I actually didn't just study. Um, and, you know, I was fortunate in that I didn't have to study much, but I took music lessons, organ and piano. I think studying music is really good for your brain. And I really enjoyed it. And, you know, being creative uh, 
and playing music is, is something that I found also really calming. Uh, so that, that was really important. I played a lot of sports. Um, fast pitch was my favorite, but I did also play basketball and volleyball and soccer. Uh, and so that was a way to be more in my physical body and be part of teams and, and that closeness, which is a good way to also maybe practice some leadership skills. Um, and I volunteered quite a lot. And I mentioned those things because I think it's really important and, and I think doctors are better if they have very well-rounded experiences. Um, and so we're, we can best use the science that we learn when we understand more about the relationships and the people and the world around us. Just knowing the science really isn't enough to be a good, good doctor. So I always encourage people to explore lots of different uh, opportunities, whether that's in the courses that you take um, or whether it's having some time maybe not going straight through to university and doing some traveling and getting maybe some work experience in some different places, doing some internships, uh, exploring your passions and you know it's okay and it's likely you're going to be passionate about more than one thing, right? So I love my career uh, but some of my other things that I really love like writing or, or working out or dancing with my friends, those things all support me in the work that I do um, and nourish my spirit, which is important um, for my overall health and, and job satisfaction too. So having lots of different well-rounded experiences is it's important. And when you're younger, it's like a great time to really take every opportunity that you can. Uh, in high school, often people want to know like what kind of courses I took or how how I made that transition from high school to university. And like I said, I was the first person in my extended family on either side to go to university, which meant I didn't have older relatives who could help me. Hard to imagine, but this was also pre-internet days, so I couldn't just do a Google search or be on a webinar like this and ask questions. It was like, the big, huge books from different universities in the guidance counselor's office. And by the time I was in high school, I still had teachers um, who really supported me, but it wasn't the same then in terms of the focus on Indigenous success. And, and so it wasn't like I had a, a mentor or someone really pushing me to apply to university or showing me the way. I had to figure out a lot of that on my own. So starting around grade 10, I'd be looking at the academic calendars from the universities, trying to figure out what courses to take so that I was best positioned for the courses I would have to take in university. And so I took all university entrance sciences, so biology, physics, and chemistry. Physics is was by far my least favorite. Um, I liked chemistry the best. Um, I took language class, well, French, uh, English, but I took some fun things too, like drama, and I was in the school choirs. Uh, and like I said, I played sports, but uh, a lot of the, that process of applying to university and figuring out how to get headshots and, and paying the fees was stuff I really had to figure out on my own. Uh, and it's tough, but it's possible. Uh, and so if I had different supports available, uh, and certainly there's more supports now available for Indigenous high school students, I certainly would use every, every support available, um, getting lots of different perspectives, having all your options on the table so that you can pick the one that works best for you. So I graduated from high school in 1995, quite a long time ago now, uh, and I went straight into the University of Winnipeg. And I chose the University of Winnipeg for one thing, uh, it was closer to where I lived and my dad worked kind of downtown, which meant he could drop me off in the morning. I was still living at home with my parents um, because we didn't have a lot of money anyway that we could try to cut down on the costs was important for me. Um, and I took a three-year Bachelor of Science degree, and my, my major was in biochemistry, uh, and I had a second major in biology, and that did help me with the transition into medical school, certainly helped me with the medical college admissions test. The one thing I would have done differently uh, once I kind of understood a bit more about 
medicine and and the actual practice of being a doctor is I would have taken some more non-science courses actually. Um, and I, courses like sociology or psychology or indigenous studies, courses like that, that really help you to think critically, uh, to start seeing perspectives other than your own, uh, to understand how organizations work, how healthcare works, how the world around us works. I think all of that is really beneficial and is one thing that I, I would have done differently. I did my three-year degree in three years, uh, which meant right from the beginning, I was uh, at right from the first year, uh, paying attention and learning as much as I could about medical school admissions processes and what it was going to take. Uh, I was paying for school through a combination of student loans and some bursaries. And I also worked every summer and part-time uh, during the school year. So it was busy. It was a period of time because I had to work so much and study so much uh, and be in class that I wasn't doing some of those other activities like playing sports or, or music. And I, I did miss that. It wasn't the happiest time of my life. And so that would be kind of the second lesson for that time that I would think about is, you know, if I had done a three-year degree, maybe in four years, it would have been a bit less stress and maybe I could have done, had a bit more balance in my life and done some of those other things that also made me happy. Uh, I mean, in the end, it, it worked out for me, uh, but it, it, it was a hard journey um, to becoming a doctor uh, at a young age. So after my second year of, med school, med or of sciences is when I wrote the medical college admissions test, uh, which is now administered by computer. At the time, we had to go in and write it on paper. Um, most schools in Canada, most medical schools in Canada require you to do the MCAT. It can be quite a significant part of how you get scored to get into medical school. Um, there's also interviews, mostly what they call multiple mini interviews now, but some panel interviews. I did uh, very well on the MCAT just because of how my brain works, right? I think Sometimes the tests that we do are more about our ability to take tests as opposed to the core knowledge. Um, and with tests like the MCAT, you have to be able to do both. You have to have the core knowledge and you also have to be able to answer the kind of questions that they ask. Uh, and so really important to take practice tests to get your to get used to the kind of questions they ask and what kind of answers they're looking for and be able to, to do it under pressure. I did well on the MCAT on my first try, which is also kind of unusual. It's not uncommon at all for people to take it more than one time to get a score that's competitive for medical school. And I think it's important to know that uh, because sometimes people might, might get really down on themselves or feel like a failure or they're not good enough um, instead of realizing that actually a lot of people have to try more than once on the MCAT and try more than once to get into medical school. So um, I did well in university. My GPA was high enough to apply to medicine. And like I said, I did well on the, the medical college admissions test. So I did apply that year as well. And I graduated from my bachelor's degree in 1998. And I started medical school uh, in the fall of that year here at the University of Manitoba. Um, in medical school, I was really lucky because that was really the first time that I met and built relationships with other Indigenous medical students and physicians, and they really sought me out uh, to be able to mentor me and support me, and I learned very early in med school how important it was to have a strong Indigenous identity. There were lots of experiences of racism, and personally, in order to not internalize that racism, I uh, I thought it was so important to learn about all the strengths and, and beauty of our identities as Indigenous peoples too. It was like a form of resistance. And then it built these incredible connections that have sustained me and nurtured me and supported me to this day, right? 
connecting to my own identity, connecting to other people who had similar experiences and passions and visions to really serve Indigenous communities and close gaps in Indigenous health. And I learned so much, uh, like the mentorship and teaching of it too. So those are really important relationships to find. And, uh, you know, the really important lesson from that for me was building community uh, within the, the medical school or healthcare system, as well as strengthening connection to community outside of that, right? Like how important it is to have both um, at, because community is just always going to be so core and central to our health and well being as Indigenous peoples. Um, and so throughout med school, uh, again, I was able to do some traveling. And so I spent some time up in Nunavut in a couple of different Inuit villages, learning about Inuit health and, and life. And uh, I spent a couple months, one summer in Norehouse Cree Nation. That's where my grandpa's family was from, uh, but nobody had been there for a couple of generations uh, because my Cree great-great-grandmother who was from there had married a non-status man. Uh, which meant she lost her status. So when there was a house fire and he died and some of the children died, um, they had been living in one of the Hudson's Bay houses because he worked for Hudson's Bay. Um, but she, the house was gone. She had nowhere to live and now being non-status couldn't stay in the community. And so that was the generation that left Norway house. Um, my dad is registered with Paguas. So that's the, the my other roots there. Um, and eventually came down through and settled in the Victoria Beach area. So it was really special to be able to go to Norway House. And my grandma and grandpa were still alive at that time. And they had really wanted me to go and try to find the archives and the, the paper records of our family life there. Uh, because at that point, the paper records that we had that really showed our, our link in my grandpa's Cree ancestry back to that community um, they didn't have names on them. They said things like so-and-so, like my great-great-grandfather married a Cree woman from Norway House, uh, which is not good enough or considered sufficient or wasn't considered sufficient for my grandpa to be reinstated. Um, he was also a Nishinaabe, had a grandmother from a uh, broken head. So... Um, in Norway House, I got to see the lands where my, my ancestors lived and raised families and, and fished. Unfortunately, the records had either burned in a church fire or been sent to archives, so I, I didn't get to do that, um, but I got to be on the land. And again, with each experience, started to learn more about what shapes the health of Indigenous peoples. Um, so that I could really start to visualize the career that would like both nurture me and use the best gifts that I had in service of communities and also make the biggest impact possible. I also went to Zambia and worked in a rural hospital for a few months as a medical student uh, because I'd always been interested in, in global health as well. And it was a really fantastic experience and I, I learned a lot, but it also showed me that where my passion was and where my first commitment and responsibility is, is to my family and communities here at home. So I haven't done any international work since then. Which is not to say that it's wrong for people for whom that is their passion and their calling. There's so much work to do. It just wasn't right for me, at least not at this point in my career. I ultimately went into the specialty of internal medicine. Um, I didn't even know what that was until I was a few years into medical school, to be honest. But it's a specialty that can be quite general because it can include cardiology and nephrology, which is the kidneys, oncology, so cancer, gastroenterology. It's kind of all of adult specialized medicine that doesn't need surgery. And the reason I went into internal medicine was because of that wide knowledge base and knowing the impact that chronic diseases like diabetes and heart disease and lung disease were having on um, Indigenous peoples. And so I went uh, into residency. I did my first two years here. 
in my second year while I was here, my dad had a really serious heart attack and it was a really challenging experience um, in that he experienced a lot of racism in his health care. And I actually, uh, he, uh, he had a cardiac arrest more than one. Um, and so it wasn't like he could advocate for himself. So I had to get to the hospital quickly and go into the emergency room and like directly advocate for his care. And so he's still alive today, but it was a very, very difficult experience. And even though I had read statistics and journal articles and heard other people's stories of experiencing racism in healthcare, um, seeing it and experiencing it that way in a way which really uh, was life-threatening for my dad, again, helped shape what kind of work I wanted to do as a doctor. It was that that made me realize like down to my core that like the science of it is critically important. I had to know why my dad was being ventilated or like why he had a breathing tube in. I had to know how to read an EKG, which is all about electrical signals. I had to know what medications he could be sedated with and what the next step was um, for the angiogram. But I also had to learn why no one else in the room was, was using that knowledge to help him right? Like there was a barrier for the scientific and excellent knowledge all those people had in giving my dad the health care that he needed. And that happens all too often for Indigenous peoples. And that's where understanding things like racism and critical race theory and critical feminism and so why women get discriminated against in healthcare and homophobia and transphobia and why, you know, two-spirit, queer, trans people uh, don't often get the best health care, had to understand all of that so that we could actually bring the best of science and medical care um, to everybody because everybody has that right to the highest quality of health care and the highest attainable standard of health. So for a variety of reasons, including how traumatic that experience was, I actually left Manitoba for a few years and I finished my internal medicine residency in Saskatchewan. And then I went down to the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore and did my master's degree in public health because I really wanted to prepare myself to work at a systems level and in health policy and, and in leadership because that's where I had decided or realized that my passions lay and where I could have the impact that I wanted to have. Um, and so... Uh, I did that additional training and ultimately came back to Manitoba in 2007, and I've been practicing here ever since. And uh, just before we start responding to some questions, I'll just explain a bit about what my work looks like now. I have, um, I would say, four to five different jobs or different things that I work at. I do see patients uh, Wednesday mornings at a place called the Adult Medical Clinic at the Grace Hospital. And uh, I have a cardiology focused practice. So I didn't do a fellowship in cardiology, uh, but we do a lot of cardiology and general internal medicine. Um, and so there's a lot of it that I can do. And, and I love that. I love talking to patients. I often see patients with chest pain or who have new heart failure, like fluid on their lungs because their um, heart function function isn't what it should be. Uh, people with rhythm problems who maybe need pacemakers or medications for that or different procedures. I love listening to hearts and, you know, sometimes I hear murmurs and, and order people tests and get them set up for open heart surgery to fix their valves. Uh, so I do that on Wednesday mornings and I really like to have that clinical practice because that's kind of where I see the downstream impacts um, on people's health. And of course I love uh, when I get to see indigenous people and one of my favorite things is when they come in and they they didn't realize they were gonna see an indigenous doctor and the kind of conversations that we can have and, and like it's unusual, like it's still unusual for most people to see an indigenous doctor. So I try to make it a really good experience and it's really fulfilling when they feel safe and, and heard and I can actually help them too. I'm also a public health doctor um, and I've had a few different public health jobs right now. I am one of the medical officers of health with First Nations Inuit Health Branch and in, in here in Manitoba. 
most of my work for the past two years has been focused on COVID-19. And so use a lot of math skills in terms of understanding the epidemiology. And we have First Nation specific data here, which is really excellent. Um, so I need to be able to understand, you know, virus transmission and what are respiratory droplets versus airborne spread and how do mask works and, you know, evaluate the evidence around all of that, why ventilation is important, and what different markers of ventilation are, um, understanding why the housing situation and overcrowded housing has been such a major determinant of the higher rates of COVID that we've seen in Indigenous communities, being able to understand why rates are actually, rates of severe illness due to COVID are actually higher in the South and in urban centres compared to in the North where there's nursing stations like it's it really has um used all of my science and math background to do things like that and so for example uh one of the things that we do is we often compare what's going on in first nation communities to the rest of manitoba and so i know that the severe outcome rates are higher so for example the hosp case hospitalization rate is over 10 percent for first nations people which means out of 100 people who get covid 19 um, 10 or 11 are going to end up in hospital uh, that number is closer to seven for the general population so it's about one and a half times and then we compare mean and median ages so those measure roughly the same things but slightly different uh, and when we look at the age differences we saw that those severe outcomes are actually happening like 15 to 20 years younger for first nations people and that meant we had data to be able to advocate to make sure um that First Nations <laughs> quiet. Someone's at the door, so one second. Okay, sorry about that. It was one of my neighbors who actually is also my patient and wants one of his friends to be my patient too. <laughs> mm. So we're able to use our data to get First Nations people access to the vaccine at younger ages and also to ensure that our first shipments of vaccines started going to First Nations communities um, for elders in the communities. And then when Manitoba started vaccinating um, healthcare providers, we also made sure that traditional healers and knowledge keepers were recognized as really important health providers as well, carriers of knowledge necessary for health ceremonialists who do ceremonies to support our like holistic well being. And so um, we were able to make sure that elders and knowledge keepers and traditional healers also got vaccinated very early on. And that was really a, um, one of the most powerful examples in my life of bringing together the value of and um, teachings from Indigenous knowledges around health and healing, as well as kind of the best of Western medicine with this new vaccine that was highly, highly effective you know, at, at preventing even infection uh, before, you know, the latest variants came around. And so uh, I spend on average um, about three days a week doing this kind of public health work. I also do work in uh, sex positive, healthy sexuality, trying to normalize getting tested and treated for uh, sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections. And I do that work with one of our urban indigenous organizations here called Ganiganichik. And again, it's around having indigenous leadership in services uh, for indigenous peoples um, and out of indigenous organizations. So when it's culture-based and community-based, we serve our communities better. And I uh, you know, put a lot of work and advocacy into that over the years. So it's really nice to be seeing that play out. 
I, I do also work in a university. I'm the Vice Dean for Indigenous Health, Social Justice and Anti-Racism. And there are really two main, two main things I try to do in the university and it's some of the national work I do too. One is to make the learning environment environment safer for Black and Indigenous learners, other learners of color. Um, and so addressing racism and different forms of discrimination in the learning environment. Uh, and then the second thing is to try to, and I have big teams of people that I work with, but trying to um, educate future doctors and nurses and rehab specialists and dentists and pharmacists to be able to provide more high quality culturally safe care. So through curriculum and admissions processes and uh, as doctors or health professionals, we have to do continuing professional development. So we, we always have to be learning. And so even having education opportunities and building relationships uh, with colleagues so that they can also provide more culturally safe care and then ensure that that's what they're role modeling to the future doctors and nurses. And so I do that, you know, about a day and a half a week. And of course it's lots of, a fair bit of after hours work. I try to have some good boundaries around that though so I can re be really present in my kids' lives and so that I don't get burnt out. Um, so I think, you know, I'll, I'll stop there and we can spend the rest of the time for the next, I think, 15 or 20 minutes or so with whatever questions people might have. Great, thanks, um, Dr. Anderson. So, um, like I mentioned before, we do take um, participants' questions prior to um, mm -hmm. when they register. So a lot of those, um, I had the opportunity of putting in the Q&A um, I'm not sure if you can see them, but I can go yeah. through them with you if you want, if that's easier. Um, but there was a lot, <laughs> a lot of questions. A lot of, so hopefully we'll try yeah. and get through as many as we can. Um, and anyone watching as well, if I didn't um, get a chance to put your question in the question and answer, just feel free to add it yourself um, as well. But I think tried to get as many as that were already submitted so hopefully they're all here but um the first one's kind of very uh, like an overview of like why did you want to do what you wanted to do um mm -hmm. what's the best part of your job and mm -hmm. how has your life changed in the past 10 years okay so I I do what I do because I absolutely love it and it's what I'm called to do. So I have lots of hard days, um, but I wouldn't be happy doing any other kind of work. And so instead of looking for other things to do, I just try to keep looking for things that keep me healthy while I do what I do. Uh, and that for me means going to ceremonies, having strong connections, working out, spending lots of time outside. But I absolutely what, love what I do and I can see the way that it makes a difference. Um, and it's the, dif the difference that I wanted to make and that is uniquely mine to make, right? Uh, and so other people are gonna be doctors or serve communities in other ways that will be unique to them. And I just think it has to be the way that you're really called to serve and that you really love to serve. So that's why I do what I do. Best part of my job is definitely when I am in community working, right? And sometimes that community is my team in Angamazen. So I work with um, Indigenous nurses and doctors and academics, and we brainstorm and support each other and do this work together. Or when I'm out, like I mentioned, at Gani Ganichik, working in that organization, or out at a lodge, learning from knowledge keepers and elders. But the best part of my job is the community connections that support it. And then in terms of how my life has changed in the last 10 years, well, I have an 11 year old and an eight year old. So being a, a mom and being a doctor is, 
is really different. I'm a lot more confident um, in myself and in the skills that I have. And I've worked long enough now, like I've been in practice for 15 years where I can see the impact of that hard work in those hard days. So it, it does look different, yeah. And I'm sure um, just to add on to that, how much different it's been for you since the COVID-19 pandemic and mm -hmm. everything that's happened. I mean, you've already touched on that, but I'm sure you've seen such a dramatic change in like <laughs> how your environment might look day to day or, you know, compared yeah. to before we all have, right? <laughs> Definitely like the remote work. But the other thing that's funny is I do a ton of media in Manitoba. And so sometimes I get recognized places when I'm out with my kids. So they think I'm a big celebrity, but I just tell them like, it's just COVID famous, like it's limited, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Mm -hmm. um, okay, the next question is, uh, would you recommend this career path or university um, programs to others interested or not interested? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like I, like I've mentioned, there have been for sure hard times along the way, but I'm so fulfilled in my career. I'm really passionate about it still. I love what I do, but the only thing I would say is if you don't have that passion for medicine, then find what you're passionate about. Um, you know, it might not be being a doctor, might be being a nurse or a different kind of healthcare provider. It might be something completely different. I think university is excellent. And if you're just not sure what you want to do, then take a whole bunch of different courses and get a whole bunch of different opportunities until you find the one that really fits for you. That's great advice on that note as well. Um, you did mention this uh, a few times, but um, just in general, like what piece of advice would you give to your younger self? Um, and, and I'm interested in this, like um, prior to deciding your career choice, but also as you were going through um, your career choice, you um, touched on some areas where, you know, you might've done things differently or you would have given alternative advice to you if you had a chance to do so just elaborate on that a little bit for us. Yeah. So the first one would be slow down. <laughs> okay. Like take some time being a teenager and then transitioning into your twenties is such a cool time to really explore and get to know yourself. Um, and so if, for example, my kids wanted to take a year off between high school and their first degree or between a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, I would totally support that. Like just slow down so that, you know, you can have those experiences of, of discovery and exploration. And then I just said the other one again, which is take lots of different courses so you can explore lots of different areas and get lots of broad perspectives. Um, and then the other thing, and it's kind of related to slowing down, is be really cautious about only nurturing one part of yourself or only focusing on one thing. Like I did that for a lot of years with focusing on, you know, my brain and my university path but like academically, and I wasn't the happiest. And I think I could have been happier if I had kept up and nurtured some of the other parts of myself, like creative self and sports and physicality and, and things like that. So though, like it's okay to slow down. And sometimes it's hard if you're a perfectionist or an overachiever um, like me to kind of slow down instead of seeing it as a race. Um, but yeah, I, I think that would be a big one. Yeah, for sure. Um, so this next one, you kind of already answered it a little bit, but the first part is, you know, how did you decide? I mean, you kind of explained that this is something you had a passion for since you were really young. Mm -hmm. um, but the second question is a little bit more specific and this um, is uh, expected from our target audience. Mm -hmm. but what looks good? on the uh, university applications? Like, um, do you remember um, certain things maybe that you had to focus on or um, maybe courses that you put a little bit more priority into for mm -hmm. getting into this? And like, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. 
No, it's a it's a really good question. And um, the first thing I would say is different universities look for different things and different programs within universities look for different things. So there's not a single right answer to this question. Um, but some of the things that I that I look for, because I still review admissions applications and discuss admissions criteria and stuff. Certainly we want to know people um, can work hard and focus on their studies. So the marks do matter for that. Um, we like to see well-rounded people. So again, people who you know study and work on their academics, but who do also uh, do other things that they care about. I, I still think volunteer and work experience looks good um, because that again shows a bit around discipline, around service, um, shows some strength and fortitude to be able to balance different things. Uh, so I think those are a, a few pretty common things across applications. And then when you have an idea that you might want to go say into medicine, it's good to look ahead at what might prepare you and kind of map it back. So when I went to medical school, for example, and things have changed since then, but the admissions criteria kind of change all the time, you had to have an English course and you had to have third year bio, uh, biochemistry. And so I had to map back from like what were the prerequisites for biochemistry and make sure I took organic chemistry in year two and intro chemistry in year one and high school chemistry in high school. So in order to keep your options open, um, it's good to kind of have just a sense of where you might want to go so you can plan your course schedules to set you up for that. Great. Um, I like how specific you are. <laughs> <laughs> That's extremely helpful, though, really. Um, and um, this question is actually um, a really interesting one. Um, it's kind of related to some of you know working within community and some of that community-based approach that you talked about. And um, I thought this one was really interesting. It was submitted without context necessarily. So if anybody here is watching and asked this question, <laughs> please feel free to elaborate. But um, it, it says, how can we indigenize our thesis uh, in grad school, I assume, but um, in, in some cases, this applies to undergraduate school as well. And, and if you have an experience with this, like indigenization of, you know, the institution or the mm -hmm. program in and of itself, and if you can talk about that. Yeah, that is a, a really big question. Um, so when I was on my first maternity leave, it was 2010. Um, and I'd been in practice for three years at that point so I was really basically getting my feet wet and and learning about this system and you kind of have to build you have to build some foundations if you want to be a leader um, or to contribute in those ways but when I was on mat leave kind of unexpectedly uh, one of my colleagues and mentors Dr. Catherine Cook reached out to me and asked me to apply for a new job there was a new a newly created section of First Nations Métis and Inuit Health within our, our medical school. And she asked me up to apply to be the head of it. And to be quite frank, I was like underprepared because I was junior in my career. Uh, but there was a fair bit of pressure for me to do that. So I, I went in and did the job interview while I was on mat leave. And when I went back to work after my mat leave, I stepped into this leadership position. And one of the best parts about that was at the same time, they hired a senior uh, First Nations nurse administrator as well. So a nursing leader, her name is Melanie McKinnon to do more like the direct oversight of what was then called the Northern Medical Unit, sending you know docs and nurses out to many Northern First Nations as well as Inuit communities in Nunavut. And uh, we had lots of conversations around our vision for the, the section. Um, and one of the things Mel said to me, which resonated and has been kind of our bedrock approach since, is 
when she interviewed for her position, she told them that she was only going to accept it if she could show up to work every day as her whole being. So as a, as a Cree woman, um, and that that was going to be the teachings she brought in. That was the connections, the grounding, the identity. And that was the way we were going to lead from our whole beings as um, Cree and I'm Anishinaabe as well, women. And to me, that is actually the heart of indigenization. It's when we can bring our whole beings into whatever academic work it is that we're doing and not have that pressure to conform. And so this was pretty, this was very new in universities at the time. It wasn't like indigenization or decolonization was a big thing across the board the way it is now, you know, whether that's lip service or action, you know, places are in really different places. Like we were kind of out on a limb on our own in this. And uh, one of the things that we did in our strategic plan, so that's kind of a vision and plan to get there that lots of different organizations will use is instead of doing like regular Western business principles, um, we had, we use the 13 grandmother teachings as kind of our ways of being and how we were going to work in the setting. Um, and it was so kind of out of the box that some of our team members at the time, like non-Indigenous team members, um, were very threatened by it and called the employee assistance program. And like there was a whole big counter reaction to us bringing our teachings into the work and saying, we actually expect you to live by these teachings too. And, you know, it was kind of bizarre in that some of the teachings are around things like respect, which is not an Indigenous specific <laughs> value or principle, but because it was framed as the grandmother teaching and the way it was explained, there was some resistance to that. But we held firm. Um, we knew this was who we had to be and how we had to work if we were going to do it and be successful. And so in any arena, so whether that's writing a thesis or doing a project or however it is, to me, indigenization at the individual level is really having a strong sense of your own identity, knowing we're all going to grow and, and learn different things about ourselves at different time, but knowing who you are as an Indigenous person and who you're connected to and accountable to, and bringing that whole self into the work that you do. Wow. That's really amazing to hear that experience from you. Um, and I'm going to branch off that idea with this next question that just says, as a woman, specifically one of the most powerful <laughs> women in Canada, um, how did you get to this position and what was your motivation? Mm -hmm. um, you talked a lot about some of that, but just mm -hmm. based on what you just said, um, what was your motivation for like, that leadership role and like how did you continue in in that sort of face of adversity and people you know um mm -hmm. questioning and and all of the sorts of challenges you might have like um mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that experience sure i mean the um one thing i have said to myself over and over and over again is I will rest when I can be, feel confident that when my dad goes for healthcare, he's going to be safe even if I'm not there. And now that I have kids, I think about the same thing. I'll know I can rest when I am more confident that they'll get treated fairly in school, in university, and in healthcare settings. And so my family is like the most immediate motivation that I have. Um, and it's very, very crystal clear. And of course my family is not different from your families, right? We all <laughs> deserve these same things and we all want our relatives to be safe. This is just the way that my work is to do it. So that's like my core motivation. And then I also feel so much accountability and reciprocity. I'm really blessed with the knowledge keepers and healers, the mentors, the sponsors that I have in my circle. And I really want to honor their gifts to me with my hard work and service back, right? Um, and so a lot of it really is around, you know, 
we are who we are in relationship to others and in that connection to community. So that is my motivation. And I read this, a quote, I can't remember if it was Instagram or Facebook the other day around how some people lead for the sake of being a leader, like it's about the power for them. And some people um, serve and become leaders along the way in order to serve. And I really think for me, it is the latter. I would have been more comfortable and probably a bit healthier along some different parts of the way if I didn't have the leadership responsibilities that I did. But um, when they came and I evaluated how is this going to give me more influence, give me more resources, help me build more relationships and coalitions so we can have the impact, then I was, I had to step into them and um, so to me, leadership and power are tools to use in service. They're not the ends in and of themselves. Excellent, what a great perspective. Um, so the next question just says, um, what is your day-to-day -day job like? I know you talked about this already, but I'm wondering if you could reframe this a little bit and just tell us a bit about um, what your job was like prior to the pandemic and what it's like after and what you think, you know, what kind of impact your position and what you do had on Indigenous people during that kind of transition. Okay. And Jenna, sorry, can I just ask, are we wrapping up at one or what time are we wrapping up at? Sorry, in my uh, time. Too. Oh, um, we had uh, 2.30, but okay. it's up to you. <laughs> There's um, three more questions left. Okay, let's try to get through them a, a bit quickly. I, um, my kids have a commitment at 145, my time, which is 245 your time. So, okay. So day to day, I mean, to be quite honest, I go to a lot of meetings, <laughs> which is not everybody's uh, dream job. They used to be in person. Now they're mostly over Zoom or Microsoft Teams. But a lot of the work I do is, is in meetings in terms of understanding a problem, um, trying to build solutions and then trying to implement those solutions. I do do some teaching. Um, so last week uh, I gave a lecture to medical students on uh, leadership and leadership as a Korean Anishinaabe woman. Uh, and so how our identities impact our leadership. Uh, ability. So I do teaching. I do a, quite a lot of presentations. Um, like I mentioned, I see patients on Wednesday mornings. Um, and, you know, thankfully, with things started to shift with COVID, I am able to get out of my offices and back into community spaces more too, uh, which is what I, I really like to do. So that's a bit of the day to day. Perfect. And I'm going to combine these next two questions because they're kind of similar and you've kind of covered a little bit already. But what's interesting about this is um, what do you use any traditional um, Indigenous medicines or techniques? Um, is there anything like that you incorporate into your day to day or, um, you know, anything along that line? Yeah, so probably like some of you, I, I do smudge a lot and I use medicines in my own home and the kids also. Um, and so I get a lot of support from them and from going to ceremonies. When I'm talking with Indigenous patients in my clinic practice, we talk about things like that. So we talk about, for example, if someone's had a heart attack, when can they go in a sweat lodge again? Or what about sun dancing if people have diabetes? Um, and sometimes we even talk about, well, we talk a lot about spiritual health with some of them, right? It's always based on what they're comfortable with, uh, but I'm fortunate to know, to have learned um, some things that really help me, help me in that way. Um, and then, like I mentioned previously, for me, the other really big part is the teachings and how they support um, how I do the work that I do. That's great. That's so nice to hear. Um, and what surprised you the most about your career? 
Well, you know, to be honest, what's surprising me most is awards. <laughs> like, I'm really fortunate. To, you know, someone mentioned the Top 100 Award. This year, I was named the Physician of the Year in Manitoba. Um, the work is, like, the first 10, 12 years of this was so hard um, because people didn't want to talk about racism. There wasn't a commitment to closing gaps in Indigenous health. There was like very much a like pull up your socks and um, deal kind of attitude. And so, you know, more of the feedback that I got from my peers was like negative and resistant. So for things to have switched, there's a big difference, I think, after the TRC calls to action came out and the inquiry report to missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in two spirit, I think in terms of solidarity from Black Lives Matter, like there's a there's been a big tone switch. Um, and so to me, that is like very rewarding and also surprising, but in a good way. <laughs> That's great. One last one real quick. What subject did you mention not liking in high school? <laughs> and I think you liked you mentioned dancing with friends. What do you like to do? <laughs> That's a great question. So the first answer is physics. I did not like physics. Um, and yes, I haven't been able to go dancing in the last couple of years. So I don't even, um, yeah, uh, now I do TikTok dances with my kids. I want to go dancing again soon. There's a little, there's an organization in Manitoba called QPOC. So queer people of color, we like to go to the, Club 200 and I have a couple of friends who are really awesome DJs. So basically whatever, whatever they play. That's great. It was nice to end on a fun note. So yeah. I'll let you go and thank you so much to everybody who tuned in today. And thanks Dr. Anderson for your time. This was great. Thank you for having me. Take care everybody. Enjoy your weekend. Bye everyone. Thank you.